Miranda, the new book, Out of Time, tackles a tricky period uh, mm. described as the old age of youth and the youth of old age, your 40s, right? Yes, exactly that. So the idea, it's a Victor Hugo quote. So he said that 40 is the old age of youth and 50 is the youth of old age. And so I look at the bit in between where you're a bit like, so what do I do now? <laughs> I don't really know. I'm progressing to something. And I'm not sure which I want, uh, I want to be there. And I don't quite know what to do. I loved your description in the book of that time where, you know, there's kind of like two different parties going on. There's yeah. like the young people's party and then the cool old people's party. But at this point, you're kind of out in the corridor. Like you're saying, you can't avoid the awkwardness of that. Yeah, and it's a bit embarrassing is what I think. I mean, I think British people get quite easily embarrassed and that's, uh, that's kind of fine. I've, I've got no problem with that. But I think it's a bit embarrassing to acknowledge the fact that you don't feel quite kind of right about your age or where you are at at your age or you feel a bit uncomfortable because actually by that time, by your 40s, you're meant to be sorted, aren't you? So mm -hmm. you're meant to be kind of in control. You know where you are, you know what you're doing with your career and your relationships and everything like that. That should be sorted. And so to kind of admit that you're not or you feel like you might have done it wrong, which is quite a strong feeling, um, that's, that can be quite hard to deal with. And it's kind of fine to be you know, old and cool and young and cool is kind of fine. But the bit in the middle, it's quite hard to find, you know, how, how do you fit in with that? I remember weirdly talking to Grayson Perry and he said, obviously, you know, he is Grayson Perry and he has his male look and his female look. And he said, it's quite an awkward age around 50 as a tranny because you can't quite, I mean, and it's actually similar for women where anyone puts makeup on. It's quite, you can't get the look quite right because you don't quite look old enough to, to carry off a certain look and you don't quite look young enough to carry another look off. I think this is it. It's a, it's a funny time. And especially because any attempt to kind of embrace something new or do something different can be read as, yeah. you know, people will mock it and say it's the sign of a midlife crisis. You know, if, I don't know, you get a piercing or start wearing leather yeah. leggings or, you know, yeah, a tattoo a, or whatever. Exactly, a tattoo or Botox is a classic for women. I mean, men, it tends to be more... There's a kind of very male filter for the midlife crisis, and that's because it has traditionally been seen as a male thing. And that, so the traditional male midlife crisis is to buy a sports car, bin your wife, run off with somebody younger and start wearing a baseball hat. And the, and the female equivalent is perhaps, you know, either you are divorced and you kind of start going out with younger people, or it's to do with grabbing your youth in another way to do with looks. So getting Botox or being really skinny or making or, or wearing kind of young people's fashion. And both of those things essentially are chasing after youth, but you're seen to be a bit pathetic to do it. And you know, despite the fact that we're, you know, we live in an intensely youthful society where youth is praised and extended for a really long time, actually, if you're seen as chasing after it, you're seen as a bit naff. So it is this awkward period where, you know, what are, what, are, what are you supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Do you think it's more difficult for the generation who are 40-somethings now? Because that's one of the interesting things, that that generation has its own particular features. Yes, it does. So part of the things that I wanted to look at in the book, because there's a traditional idea of midlife crisis, and I wanted to kind of look at that, and particularly with, with reference to women, but also I wanted to look at the kind of generational idea of midlife crisis. So if you had your 20s, in the 90s, which was a particular time. It was a time when, I mean, you know, obviously youth culture has happened all, for ages, but a particular kind of youth culture won at that time. So alternative culture, whether that was rave or Britpop or someone like Kate Moss or Irving Welsh was train spotting or alternative comedy, suddenly, for some reason, and this hadn't happened in the 80s, was allowed in. And it, people went, yeah, it's great. This is absolutely brilliant. Tabloid said, great. You know, people were invited into into number 10. This was the alternative culture which suddenly became the mainstream. And so everyone who was involved in it, and I would include myself in that, thought, great, we've, we've done it. We've cracked it now. We're right. And everyone else is wrong. And all these principles that we had for a really long time are winning. And so that meant that you led your life in a particular way. So you might have rejected a more conventional route, whether that was working in a factory or training to be a lawyer or whatever. And you thought a kind of freelance life to do with creativity was the way forward. And that's brilliant and at the time I think it's right and I've always been freelance and there's a certain joy to that life but that's a very different life when you're in your 20s than it is in your 40s and also in between the internet happened and kind mm -hmm. of like devastated quite a lot of ways of making money at, at, at that time so you arrive in your 40s having had a, a, an amazing kind of youth when your youth took over and you still believe all those principles but you're in your 40s and you might have kids and you might have a mortgage to pay and you're not getting paid how you used to. And also, 
it's kind of harder work. You know, if you are a comedian, say, and you've got to traipse up and down the M1 every Saturday night at 2 o'clock in the morning, that's kind of hard in your 40s. It's great when you're in your 20s. But it's much harder when you're older. Yeah, so it's, it's about finding finding a new way through a yeah. completely different landscape because you know what you perhaps what you were doing before which worked really well kind of doesn't I mean that's I guess that's always been the case with, yeah. with midlife crises how long have have we been having these I mean <laughs> historically and and how much of the features of them have changed well I think we I think they've been happening for quite for quite a while but the person who kind of nailed the the term I suppose is a bloke called Elliot Jacques and he uh, is a Canadian kind of uh, psychologist and he came up with the term in 1965 and uh, he, uh, he used it to for kind of high achieving men so there were people who'd done really well and they'd hit their mid midlife which they, he took as about 35 um, and uh, they were beset with doubt so they didn't feel like they were at the top of a, of a mountain they felt like they were in a big dip and so he coined the term midlife crisis and it just kind of, for whatever reason, you know, if you get a phrase right, it, it took off. And it's not like it hadn't existed before. Carl Jung's really good on, you know, if you, I recommend anyone to read it, Carl Jung around your 40s. He believed that uh, we should all go to a kind of university of midlife in your 40s and kind of sort yourself out a bit, which would have been good brilliant. Idea, I know, it? Yeah. Great. I'd like that. I know, I thought that. And uh, that would just be fantastic. But, you know, obviously, I don't think you'd get the... The grants these days, <laughs> there you go. And so it has been around for a while, but it really was assumed to be just for men for a really long time. So some w women wrote some really great books around the late 70s and early 80s trying to say this might, you know, this is also a female thing. But because women's lives then were so different to men's lives, so essentially they got married, they had the kids really young. Um, and then their midlife crisis kind of came when the kids didn't need them anymore but they had no work and they weren't qualified to do any work. So the women who were writing these books would tentatively suggest that might be they would get a job and they would try, but quite actually, weirdly, quite a lot of their husbands didn't want, it, didn't want them to get a job. Mm -hmm. So they were stuck basically in a boring house, dusting the ornaments for 30 years. I mean, you know, that, there was massive, massive incidents of, of women on, on Valium, obviously, for these, for these reasons. And it has changed now because women are in the workplace. I mean, we're 50-50 in the workplace. But it's still, there are other factors. So women's earnings, top earnings is at the age of 34 on average, and men is at the age of 50. So it's still... There's a disparity there. Yeah, there's a disparity. And in terms of the experience, what are the features of a female midlife crisis, would you say, having done all of your research? <laughs> I mean, I know that you talk about both and, and the differences in the book, but, yeah. but for women? Well, I think um, there are various factors you're competing in a similar workplace so the workplace factors are still there and the workplace factors essentially say that once you hit 50 you're very likely to lose your job or be demoted even if you're great the stats tend to say that that would happen um, so you have to consider that women tend to do much more of the child care and in fact women generally tend to do more caring full stop so when I was feeling kind of really down with my midlife crisis I looked to music as I always do <laughs> to try and cheer myself up and I'd look at kind of people women that inspired me so I'd look at like Debbie Harry or Chrissy Hind or Viv Albertine or Patti Smith all these people that you know you kind of think they are rock and they just carry on and they're brilliant and actually all of them had kind of taken a time away from performance or from mm. art or whatever to do some caring whether they were caring for kids or a partner or whatever they were caring in, for quite a long time in their middle age mm -hmm. and you have to come to terms with that as well that's something else that's happening I think. so it's the sandwich generation thing yeah. I mean I know in, in Debbie Harry's case I think it was caring for a partner yes it was, it was Ill, yeah but, but um yeah I mean that's that's part of it as well so even if you don't have kids you might have yeah. responsibilities for other families yeah and there's other factors as well there's two kind of particularly female factors that I thought were, were weirdly worth a whole book so I didn't really tackle them and one was if you wanted to have kids and you haven't had kids by the time you hit middle age because obviously there's an element of that's it then so you have to readjust and the other one was the menopause there's people who've written entire books on the menopause which I think are very good and I would recommend but you can't really cover it in a chapter mm. so I've just kind of touched on those uh, on those things because they're so big I think childlessness if you when you want to have children is such a big thing that you almost need two separate books for that really so I didn't you know I allude to that but it's not not 
you know, a fundamental part of the book. So what is the cause of the kind of classic midlife crisis? Is it culture? Is it nature? I what think is it, it? it's a lot of things. I think uh, it's your dreams, you know, <laughs> I mean, not to be too kind of naff about it. We all have an idea of how we hope our lives will be like or how we will be. And those dreams are very much encouraged, you know, especially in a capitalist society, you're like, hey, have a dream, go for it, it's going to be great. But live actually, your dreams. Yeah, live your dreams. Actually, it's really hard to live your dreams. It's really, really difficult, you know, and to, we're not very good at it. <laughs> and to, to come to terms with the fact that your dreams, which kind of cast a light across the whole of your life, this is what I thought I might be doing, this is what I thought I was good at, this is what I thought I would achieve. If that's casting this light across your life and you feel like your life doesn't live up to it, then you feel, you're bound to feel bad about it, you know? And, and I think those, that's a really understandable feeling, mm -hmm. you know? You can call it magical thinking, you know, the idea that you're gonna play for Man United or whatever, and you're not, and, or the idea that you're going to own a big pink house in the country, you know, or, or have 10 kids, or be amazingly successful at art or something, and you're not. And to c actually come to terms with that, you know, tends to happen in middle age, and that's really hard, and that you, across a lot of societies and they used, they thought or oh, maybe it was just a kind of you know confirmation bias but actually across a lot of societies it's been proved that there's a happiness dip in the middle of in middle age so you're really happy when you're really young you're really happy when you're really old and you there's a big dip in the middle and even chimpanzees have this orangutans and you poor said orangutans. orangutans have midlife crises they definitely have midlife crises and so it's an existential thing as well and then i think that generally kind of a consumer society will work, you know, as consumer societies do, do, does, it will work on those insecurities and go, hey, you could be looking slightly younger. Okay. You could be looking slightly better. You could be achieving this, you know. The so it's a natural thing that's exacerbated, that's exacerbated by. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it is, it, it's, I think it's a scary prospect. Mm. What, I mean, you wanted to write the book because you were, you were kind of living it and going through it. <laughs> What was that like? Did that make it harder or easier or...? Well, what? it's hard. I mean, you know, it made... Writing's a brilliant thing. It's like any form of kind of creative exercise that you take something, whatever that is, that emotion. You know, if I could play the guitar, maybe I'd do, you'd do it on the guitar. But, you know, writing's my job, so that's what I do. And you write it out. And I've read some of the stuff that I've written and, you know, I wouldn't show it anyone. It was appalling and terrible. But, you know, you keep writing and you keep researching and see what happens. And that, that kind of definitely helps, really. But I think that, for me, I was trying to find a way of, of being in my life and being happy, you know, because obviously my life to, you know, th these are first world problems I'm talking about. Here I am, you know, talking to you. I have a lovely life uh, from the outside, you know, and it is a lovely life. But just because you have a lovely life from the outside doesn't mean that you always feel great about it. And you have to work out a way of coping with, th with the things, you know, adulthood generally requires a kind of energy that was, doesn't come natural to me. I'm quite an up and down, hyper kind of person. And adulthood, where you have to sit on the phone for an hour and a half to BT, or you have to read to a toddler, or they're reading to you and they still can't get that word, even though it's literally the word underneath the same word. And they're like, oh, God, kill me now. <laughs> like, you have to work on a kind of a long-term, low-level energy, mm. a kind of patience. You have to learn to stretch your patience and not take things so seriously. And that's a, a lesson that you need to learn, you know, and that's what I was trying to learn by, by reading about it and working out how to go out about my life, I suppose. Because, you know, I spoke to mental health professionals and obviously things like meditation and mindfulness is, is, are very kind of cool at the moment. I find them quite hard because I'm just, I find them quite hard, but if you, and also I find it a bit difficult to be mindful all the time, you know, because you've got things, you've got to stand on the phone for an hour and a half, you know, um, so it's quite hard to be that zen, because I just think you don't, don't get anything done, but he said something which really struck me, he said, you know, sometimes it is quite good just to be in the moment and enjoy that moment, whether you're washing up or something or, you know, talking to your kids, you know, it's easier when you're outside in nature, I think, you look at nature and your kids are happy and you think this is great and enjoy that moment because otherwise you're actively if you're looking for something else and you're not satisfied you're living you're actively living your life unhappy i suppose this generation of 40 somethings are dealing with that kind of age of distraction mm. the digital age for the first time in a way that their predecessors you know the 40 somethings of yesteryear didn't have to so that must have an effect on it as well yeah i think so because maybe they were, they would find it easier to be mindful because there wasn't kind of somebody going oh there's something over here and perhaps it, something a over digital here. culture to social yeah. media yeah brings a new and, pressure uh, yeah i think so well i think there's definitely 
you know, I, I spoke to a couple of psychotherapists, and one in particular told me that when he talks to his 40-something clients, and he definitely said there's a big dip in 40, that, you know, people definitely get a bit depressed in their 40s, um, that Facebook was a big problem um, because, and we all know why, because what, when you see what people put in Facebook is is a version of their life that they want to put on Facebook. So, uh, you know, even if it's a kind of very dramatic, I'm really depressed life, but mostly in your 40s, people want to put up, like, my kids are doing really well, this is great, you know, here we are, up. And so you find yourself judging your insides by their outsides because they're showing you they're having a great time with their kids achieving amazingly or they're on holiday or something, and you think, oh, God, I feel really terrible. <laughs> my kids are shouting at me. And, and so the, there's a kind of comparison factor, I think, with social media that can be... Difficult. Although, I would also say, in defence of social media, I've made a lot of friends through social media that I would not have done otherwise. And whenever I've actually, you know, on the rare occasions when I felt really low and said on social media, I feel really crap, people have been really kind. I yeah. mean, unbelievably kind. Even complete strangers on Twitter, unbelievably kind. So I'm not a kind of person who would say, oh, social media is a really bad thing. It's so good and bad, that. isn't yeah. it? It's just different. Yeah, I it's think. different. It's a different way of making friends and feeling connected, and that can be useful, I think. One of the things that I found really interesting in the book, which was a, a, a smaller part of it as well, really, but, but a really interesting idea, is this idea that we don't like women being sad. Yeah. In, the, in this culture, I just found that yeah. really, really interesting. Yeah. You and Suzanne Moore are having a conversation yeah. halfway through the book, and you're talking about this feeling of, of kind of being depressed and, you know, facing, thinking about getting older, menopause, all that kind of stuff. And, and Suzanne just says, you know, we just don't like women we, being sad. We're not meant to be, we're meant to cope. And we told all women are brilliant copers. We're, women are brilliant multitasking, you know, centre of life, da, da, da. We're not meant to be sad. And it makes me think of all the women in the 1970s who were getting, taking Valium. The, the equivalent now is what happens is if you get uh, menopausal symptoms, there's a, you know, a kind of time in your life which is called perimenopausal, and you get a few symptoms and you don't quite know, uh, you know, have I got a thyroid problem or am I perimenopausal? So you go to the doctor, the GP, who gives you six minutes, and literally this happened to loads of my friends, and they go, yeah, that's fine, after Prozac, anyway, see you, bye. And they, they give you Prozac. They give you Prozac for the menopause, which is just unbelievable to me. You know, that's like, that's something that naturally happens to all women, and they medicate you so you're happy all the way through it. Mm -hmm. And that... It's, it's just astonishing to me that that's the way that it's, it's treated. One of the things that Suzanne says, which really makes me laugh, is she says she thinks that private health th does really well because it, at that point, because people go and see kind of uh, private practitioners to see if there's an alternative to HRT or indeed Prozac. And it's just because they get to sit down and talk to somebody for an hour who's listening to them, you know, rather than the GP going, yeah, fine, here, it'd be Mary Paul's, we'd be like that for a while, love, take some Prozac, see ya. <laughs> you know, there's somebody actually sits down and talks to you for an hour, and they're like, oh my God, you're listening, this is amazing. Well, there are a few equivalents of that mentioned in the book, because I know that personal trainers are another... Yeah, they're really important, they're particularly important for men, actually, personal trainers, because per women are quite generally, this is a massive generalisation, but generally quite good at talking to friends, and they will express themselves, whereas men, generally, when they go out, have a kind of purpose so they're watching the football in the pub or they're doing something and so they talk about that purpose Activity, rather than their yeah. feelings and uh, so uh, a bloke from mine said to me that actually he thinks that personal trainers are really good because it's a neutral person that you can just go oh my work's really terrible and my wife doesn't understand me and you know they go yes here have some weights you feel much better you're a tiger <laughs> yeah and you do feel better i mean you know it's a, you can tend to take the, the mickey and there's nothing wrong with taking the mickey out of middle-aged men going Whoa. but it does make you feel better, yeah. you know. Well, you, though, you have to be careful as a middle-aged man, and I'm sure lots of middle-aged men watch the pool. Uh, they do, more they than do, you think. More than you think, definitely. Um, that you have to be careful not to push yourself too hard in your 40s because 93% of heart attacks around, yeah, I know, around uh, marathons happen to men in, at 49. Ooh, so be, 93%? Yeah, it's a big cluster. Uh, not at, at, it's an the, average. The actual age of 49, 90, the average. 49, yeah, yeah, 49. So it's not like the rock star's 27. No, no, where but it's very important. 27. 49 is really important because what happens is that, essentially, obviously, part of the joy of exercise, I think, is that you feel like you did when you were young. So if you're riding your bike or you're, cycling, or you're swimming or you're running, there's something in you that's exactly the same as when you were like three or seven or 17 or 27. It's the same feeling. You feel like the same person. It's amazing. But if you take that feeling too far and think you are that person that you were when you were 27, you push yourself really hard, you get very competitive, which is more common in men in their 40s, 
you can really do yourself an injury. You, know, you can have a heart attack, basically. You have to be really careful. Exercise was one of the things that helped you get through all this, though. Mm. Running specifically, mm. why? And how? I'm really bad at running. I have to say, I'm really terrible at running. I've run, my son's really good at running, which is irritating. I never ran when I was young. I, was, I did gymnastics, which is a kind of, I suppose, a sport that was a bit like me. It's quite hyper, you know, it's a big burst of energy, and then that's how you sit down for a bit. And uh, with running, obviously, you need kind of low level energy, and I'm really bad at it. So I listen to economics podcasts so that I don't go too fast because I'm going really <laughs> slowly around the park. And I do it, I'm really bad at it. I don't care what I look like or anything like that, but I am very slow, and I've had to kill my competitive urges right down. But I do it for the serotonin hit, absolutely. So I go around the park at a ridiculously slow walking pace, but running, and then come home and I just feel like I think I've got a kind of neural pathways that came from raving <laughs> that just go, ooh, exercise. It's a bit like dancing on the spot for hours. Right? And now you'll just go straight to feeling, like, I feel like I've taken three E's. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. It's like I want to go out and lick people's faces. Brilliant, this is amazing. And it's just from running around the park really slowly. <laughs> Such a cheap date. It's so, amazing. I mean, it, well, it is, and it's, it's obviously worked. What else were the things that you discovered in the book that were the kind of strategies, yeah, and techniques? Yeah, I would say that. I, th I think that what's the thing that I miss from my 20s, which is, is, is the kind of rush of it. You know, there's a thing that happens when you're young and discovering the world and getting a bit trolled in a way that I can't get trolled anymore. That, you get a kind of proper rush of something happening, sparkliness, and it's Possibility, amazing. I suppose. Yeah, and just uh, kind of, yeah, you know, if you want to be a hippie, but it's like love, isn't it? You know, coming through, and it's quite hard if you're living a life where you have to maintain, which you do as a parent, and, you know, routine, which I find very hard, it's quite hard to find that rush. And an obvious way is getting out of your head, and I wouldn't really recommend that in your 40s. I've got no moral problem with it, but generally, you know, there's terrible stats around people in their 40s getting out of their heads. So you need to get out of your head in another way. You need to leave your life, get out of time in another way. And, you know, there's obvious things. Having sex is one, but, you know, maybe whoever you want to have sex with is miles away. You can't really do that. So I would say dancing is one, music's always one, and any form of kind of weirdly, a kind of live performance, I find. So if you go and see something, even if it's really terrible, actually sometimes, especially if it's really terrible, it takes you right out of it, because you get quite cross. You know, like, this is shit, and that, <laughs> better than that, and, <laughs> and you kind of go home and, like, you know, unpick it. It's really great. And I find that going to gigs or spending a couple of hours on a dance floor or, you know, reading on public transport, I find, is really takes me somewhere else. You just have to make a little bit of time to do something like that. And that really helps, you know. And it sounds a little bit pathetic. It's quite small. But I'm a great believer in doing small things. You need to accept where you are. You know, there's, um, there's an analogy that I use, which at the beginning made me really depressed, and now doesn't make me depressed, which is, if you imagine you're playing a chess game and you're not really concentrating, this is how I approach, you know, how I approach chess because I can't really play it. So you think, I'm going to play chess and I'm going to be brilliant because I don't really care and I'm just fab. And so you play chess and it's fine and you're not really concentrating and then you go away and you come back and you look at the chess game and you think, God, I've, like, I've blown this. That's just, I've done it all wrong. Like, two, you know, we've got three or four really vital pieces have gone. Pfft, can I start again? So you say to the person you're playing, can I start again? You know, and they go, no, this is the game. This is the game, and that is the game. You've got reduced pieces, you're not as, you know, you're, you're less likely to make as much money as you thought you are, you know, if, you, if you're married to somebody, you, you are stuck with them on that epic quest that is marriage, you know, and you either give it your all or you step out. These are the pieces that you got, and you've got to play with those pieces, and that, that initially made me really scared and unhappy, and now I kind of think, that's amazing, I can play with those pieces, here they are, let's have a go, you know, mm. it's, it's exciting. I mean, you do tackle all those different kind of elements mm. in a person's life, um, relationships, money, uh, kind of jealousy of yeah. other people, the physical limitations. And, and obviously, you know, there, there's a point in midlife when you feel diminished and those things are kind of, uh, you know, you feel like you're, you have less than you used to. Yeah. What's the good side of it? Because there must be, there well, must be strengths as well as yeah, weaknesses. There's loads, I mean, I think there are loads of strengths. I think middle-aged people are really interesting, you know, so like, if I think about, you know, I mean, I think people of all ages are really 
uh, interesting. But actually, most middle-aged people have lived through quite a lot and have opinions or experiences that if you bother to sit down and talk to them, they're just fantastically interesting. That's a really important thing that I think... You know, because we're quite sniffy about middle age, it's like, oh, why, you're wise when you're old and you're vivacious when you're young, but middle age is a bit boring. Actually, I think most middle aged people are really, really interesting if you bother to talk to them. That's really important. I think um, the, the other thing that I found kind of a, not a revelation, but it genuinely understanding that it doesn't matter what you wear, <laughs> doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter in the big scheme of things. You know, I used to agonise about, you know, you go to a party and you think, oh, God, what should I wear? You know, I just really don't care anymore. And that's really freeing. And obviously, I want to look nice. I'm certainly not somebody who, doesn't, who wants to look kind of rubbish. But it's kind of in my eyes how I want to look nice, you know. So I'm less influenced by conventional ideas of what is sexy or good looking there's a relief I find also as a woman that you don't get mithered so much by blokes and I know that a lot of women do get mithered as in bothered yes exactly so that you know there's a lot of women my age who feel like they lost a certain power when they felt like they they were losing their looks that they felt like they couldn't have whoever they wanted in the room or whatever that they felt less sexy Personally, I find it more liberating. I'm quite happy to walk down the road and nobody shout at me. That's really great. I've had years of idiots shouting at me or you get rated on a kind of weird sexual table. Yeah, you, know. you can't opt out of that as well, yeah, which is it's just like, exhausting. It's, it's quite nice to not, not be it's on just it not, <laughs> yeah. It's just not relevant. You know, it's just kind of like, it's just not even interesting, you know. And that, I find that really freeing and it's just great that it's not around. You know, people say, oh, it's terrible, you're invisible. I think, brilliant. I want to be invisible. I want to be like a spy. Superpower. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's really good. I don't. I don't care if people don't notice me in the street. That's fine. It's really. It's really all right. So that I find kind of, uh, you know, inspiring. And there's also something about knowing that you have less time. That's quite. You know, all art and all life is editing, isn't it? Really. And if you know that you've got a finite amount of time, then you have to think about it. You know, think about it and think what you want to do. You know, if you look at uh, people who are older what's the name of that actress she's called Sheila and she was married to John Thor what's her Sheila name? Hancock yeah she's really brilliant on old age so she gets so she'll literally look a part or you know it's a theatre part and she'll go you know I reckon I've got about 10 summers do I want to spend my summer doing this and things like that which sound really harsh it's awful it's, when you count up like yeah, that yeah it's terrible that's the death maths you've got to, you know you've got to do it but it's terrible but if you do start doing that, you think, well, I don't really want to do that. That's absolutely not, not what I want to do. I would literally rather be skinter and hang about on the beach with my kids. Yeah, so, it's the, so with that kind of harsh appraisal of your yeah. life comes a clearer view. Yes, I think ideally, so. Ideally, if you're Yeah, lucky. exactly. And also, I think generally in life, you know, life can be... Life is amazing, but it can be really difficult, you know. It's, that's the joy of it. It's fantastic, but it's difficult at the same time. And to look at it clearly is a privilege you know it took me a long time to write this book because I was bringing up kids and having a midlife crisis and, uh, you know <laughs> getting up the same time every day all these kind of things and so to to have kind of it takes a long time to do something like that but the, to do your research and then come out and I you know finish the book and I thought well, this is as good as it can be this is what I think and now I feel more clearly about it that's a proper privilege you know to look at yourself and just have a little bit of time and think okay this is what I feel like this is how I feel about my life these are the bits I can change and this is what I'm good at and that's okay and that's great you know I think perhaps it's a point in your life when you you do decide to kind of step up as well and yeah. be be brave and, and speak yeah up. yeah and you take you know I took I spent a lot of my life a kind of being somebody on the side kind of chucking bread rolls of people, you know, like, you're rubbish, boo, you know, a bit like that. It's a kind of quite a journalistic trait, I think, you know, and, uh, and I made a deliberate decision not to do that, to, to kind of think, you know, well, if you don't like it, do something about it, just step up. So I would always do, you know, I started putting myself forward, I was on the board of a few things, I started putting myself forward for like deputy chair or something like that, stuff I'd never do, you know, or I became a school governor, uh, I've started doing a teaching kids uh, computer coding I know nothing about coding but I just thought well why don't you learn learn and then tell kids and kids you know that's great for the kids and it's great for you and it's completely absorbing and absolutely brilliant I really love doing it and I will always you know if I'm ever asked to talk now about any form of women's issues or anything like that like sometimes I just go I can't bother and now I'll go no I definitely will 
because it's important, and if it's important to you, then step up and say it's important, and all the stuff that you don't really care about, it doesn't matter, it's fine. So I think there's a bit of a, mid, a middle age thing where you might be sneery about it when you're young, you know, that you're establishment or conventional or something like that. And actually, I, I think that you need those people people of my age to step up because otherwise who's going to do it? It'll be somebody who isn't as good or as kind or as competent or as, you know, or doesn't want to do it. If you step up and put your, you know, give it a bit of welly, <laughs> then it might make a difference and that's quite good even if it's a tiny difference because to be honest, what else are you going to, you know, I'm not going to make a difference to, in the big scheme of things, the, the biggest difference I've made is to have children, that's fine. But you know, lots of people have children, you know, and I can't imagine that my kids are going to become, you know, the prime minister or anything like that. So if that's the case, if nothing you do, you know, I've written lots of words, but I don't imagine they'll last much longer than about 50 years, you know, then actually what you need to do is step up in your community and try and make that community better because that will actually have a bit more of a long you know, it would be more long-lasting, actually, than all the other stuff Maybe that you're doing. Maybe it's harder to undo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. If you get it wrong, just back away. <laughs> it wasn't me. But, but no, those things are quite important, and they're really unnatural to me. Yeah. I mean, and, and finally, I suppose, going through this process and writing the book, did it change your perspective on what your friends, your peers, and the people that you knew who'd reached this age had been through and how they'd tackled it? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I've always found... The thing that's nice about the book is I've had quite a lot of people say, oh, that's exactly what I was feeling, but I didn't realise or didn't dare say it. I mean, you know, there's a weird thing about a book that you offer it out like a little gift, and you, people might go, oh, <laughs> what a poo. And the thing that's quite nice is I offered it out as a little gift, and people were saying, oh, that's exactly how I feel, and that's all you want, because actually what you want is to know that there's a community of people who are feeling the same way. So it was quite weird... Um, there was an article I wrote before I wrote the, uh, the book and it had a kind of, you know those weird things that happen on, on the internet where they have another life for no reason, it's nothing to do with you. And it had another life at the beginning of this year actually. And I went to the Brit Awards and everybody in the music industry was like, oh my God, that article, oh my God, <laughs> that's happening to me, that's happening to me. And I kind of think, oh, that's good. Because they were all, as far as I was concerned, immensely successful, you know, leaders of the industry, you know, and they were going, oh, that's exactly how I feel. And that's all you want really, isn't it? You're offering a little bit of of yourself in order to make a connection to other people and if they say yeah that's how I feel then you feel like all right it's a whole community of us all feeling like this and that's okay it's fine we're all the same we'll get through it together that's all right there is like one guy that you meet at a music industry do yeah. in the book who claims he's not having a midlife crisis though yeah. he only makes a brief appearance but he's one of my favorite guys <laughs> yeah, there are a few there are a few people who just literally have said to me I'm not having midlife crisis and they're going so have you got a bike yeah, you go cycling every weekend, do you? That's nice. Yeah, okay. Fine. He's kind of sitting there with an earring. <laughs> yes. Oh God. Yeah. Oh no. Girlfriend yeah. who's fifteen years younger than him. Yeah. And, and he said, "I don't believe in midlife crisis." <laughs> fine, mate. That's absolutely fine. Keep not believing. Great. Congratulations, <laughs> Miranda. Thank you very much. Thank I you. I feel I feel ready for the midlife <laughs> crisis that I've been teetering on the verge of for quite a while now. I feel now that I can I can just dive into it headfirst. Yeah, go for it. I'm forearmed. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.